Skype just made you sound like a robot. <laughs> Fun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> just a moment. You are live with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here in studio. I've got uh, fellow tech nerds, John Beeler and Graham Williams uh, in with me today. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, later on in the program, uh, we'll be talking about home security tech with our good friend, uh, Aaron Lawrence from Tech Gadgets. Is it Tech Gadgets in Canada? Yes. Tech Gadgets Canada. Uh, We will also be talking about the latest in insurance technology, how technology can maybe help lower insurance rates. I'd like that. I would like that as well. Uh, And uh, a new tech from a uh, Canadian company that's working on uh, a way to use Wi-Fi for weapons detection in places like stadiums and and subways. I really like that. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a company called First Responders, so uh, we'll be checking in on them as well. Uh, let's get to some of the tech news here in uh, Canada for Get Connected. Uh, I saw that interesting story about uh, a Toronto lawyer who's advocating uh, for textilizers for police. And so apparently, I've, I haven't really seen any in action yet. I think they're still being developed, but it's a device that police would be able to plug your phone into if they pulled you over for distracted driving to see what you were doing on your phone, whether you were texting or browsing the web. I, I'm, I'm not seeing the point of this one, to be quite honest, because at this point, if the police have you for distracted driving, right, they've seen you interact with your phone, it's not in a cradle, um, you're done, right? Like, that's it, you get your ticket. Outside of that, if they need to know what else you're doing, they need probable cause. And so at this point, you're asking someone to have access to probably the most important data information appliance that I own uh, with no actual reason, right? Like, what what are you looking for? I'll see if you have any friends. (laughs) (laughs) This Uh, guy has no friends. We're taking him in. Pro tip officer, no, I don't. Um, So yeah, I I don't necessarily see the benefit of this. Uh, Can are, Are you guys... Absolutely, fully agree with you. There's no reason for you to see my phone um, unless you, like you said, there's probable cause. But even then, what could they possibly glean from being across the parking lot or whatever where they're pulling me over from? Yeah. Uh, they're not going to be able to tell I'm playing Minecraft or if I'm playing... Well, they will with the textilizer. But that's the thing is it, it doesn't matter, right? right. I mean, the, the, the crime here is interacting with a digital device that is not secured to your vehicle while the vehicle is in operation. Yeah. Like that is, that's it. Um, if you have a suspicion of something else, I've got something for you. Go get a warrant. Right? You, you can absolutely have access to my device if there is probable cause and a judge agrees with you that you should have access to my device. Otherwise, take a hike. Well, even going outside of that, the technology, I just wonder how will that even work? What if you're using uh, voice to text yeah. to do your texting? The, the phone won't be able to differentiate with that. Yeah. I mean, the the only thing that you could do reasonably is you could go to uh, Google and check the the records of something that has been sent for voice text because Google does keep track of them. Apple also does, with your permission, keep track of those. But even then... Oh, Apple will never no, <laughs> let no. people use some device like this no. to see what you're... Can you imagine the implications? Like, people would be able to get a hold of these textilizers, not just cops, but anyone, and start plugging it into people's phones to see what they've been doing. So I, I think I understand where uh, this lawyer is coming from, but I don't think that they understand the severity of what it is that they're asking for. Or the, the technological implications yeah. of it. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, the iPhone is very much a walled garden. Yeah, uh, it's I mean, locked down. And even Android at this point, uh, unless you were to, say, for example, give them root access permissions or give the app that they're trying to use to siphon this data off permissions, which I don't know about you, but <laughs> my answer is always no. I mean, I'm not one of those <laughs> am I being detained type of people, but I think we do need to understand that you do have rights as a citizen of Canada. And if you have been caught doing something wrong, Take your slap on the wrist. Don't use your phone while you're driving. And let's move on from this. Well, and it's not like there's an additional level of penalty for distracted driving, depending if you're playing a game or texting. <laughs> you, know, like, uh, you were distracted. Or shopping, or shopping on Amazon. And it's an extra $30 because you bought something terrible. <laughs> Okay, guys, we're going to have to take a a break here on Get Connected, but we've got a fascinating show. Uh, We're going to be talking with a company uh, shortly here that is developing technology to allow law enforcement to scan areas using Wi-Fi 
like Wi-Fi we have in our offices and our homes to detect weapons. Neat. A company called First Responder Technologies. We will also be talking about how insurance companies are using technology to get our rates down. And uh, if you've been looking to get some security tech for your home, we've got Erin Lawrence uh, coming on later in the program to tell us what she loves. You're listening to Get Connected here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. You are back with Get Connected. I want to talk about uh, some of the issues happening in the world right now when we uh, look at terrorism. Uh, and, you know, are there technologies out there to help uh, alleviate, uh, you know, some of these uh, these problems? In the studio right now, we've uh, got a great guest. His name is uh, Robert Delamar. He is the CEO of First Responders uh, Technology. Technologies. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to bring you into the uh, the show because uh, you guys are working on some interesting technologies to to weed out the bad guys. Essentially, can you give us kind of a uh, uh, a background of uh, what the company is all about? Sure. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and to talk about this important subject. Uh, the company was founded by a former RCMP officer, and in his experience. There's something called the critical 10 to 15 seconds in the context of any event where somebody is potentially armed with a firearm. When you walk into that event, you don't have information and it's that lack of information that makes situations so dangerous. Now, if you can extrapolate that to a broader example, say for example, a mass shooting or a terrorist event, it's really chaotic for obvious reasons. And so to the degree or extent that you can use technology to provide information, timely information to the person that's responsible for responding to that event, the opportunity there is there to save lives. And so what is your technology based around and how does it work? Yeah, so we are developing a Wi-Fi based detection system. Um, Wi-Fi is really interesting. In the electromagnetic spectrum, there's high resolution, but high radiation kind of health and safety risk type um, detection technologies. So an example is the metal detector that you go through at the airport, pardon me, not the, the detector itself, but you know, the uh, L3 machine where you go in the box and they spin yep. it around, right? You get a burst of radiation, you know how much that is. I don't even know what that thing is doing. I know precisely, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, most people feel the same way. Can they see me naked? I don't know. Right, yeah. that's exactly, well, in my case, gosh. Anyway, um, so the second part of that is they also have low resolution um, technologies. Radar is one everybody's um, ex- uh, familiar with, and you just get a little blip on a screen, right? Yeah. So Wi-Fi is in this sort of magic zone. We call it the habitable zone in, in the RF spectrum. It's similar to kind of how everybody wants to live in Italy because it's not too hot, not too cold. Yeah. So Wi-Fi allows for good enough uh, detection of, in particular, dangerous metals, so long guns, uh, in particular, that's a particular use case we're looking to protect against uh, to start. Uh, but at the same time, it's low resolution enough that it reduces some of the concerns people have about security because you can't get a visualization, for example, from that. How does it differ? I, I see a lot of weapon detections companies popping up right now. Sure. Uh, how, is, how is what you're developing right now different than the others out there? Yeah, I think we ask the question differently and... If you ask a question the right way in the world of technology, you can get answers that become fairly obvious to people. It's the, oh, why didn't I think of that? I think Wi-Fi is a technology that enables us to do that. So the question we're asking is, how can you find bad people? Because the reality is in a mass shooting event, for example, there may be many people at that event who come along later and have, or are on premises and are armed. Police officers carry guns. In the United States, for example, huge portions of the population have concealed carry permits. So we're not looking for guns. We're looking for bad people with guns. And it's the asking of that question, how do you identify and stop a mass shooter that has led to the product stack that we are envisioning? And we think that product stack has a lot of advantages over what the competition is developing because we're looking at it from the perspective of really the internet, the way the internet should be, which is cheap, which is accessible, which is quickly deployed. Um, and Wi-Fi allows you to do that. Everybody has a Wi-Fi uh, antenna in their home, their access point, right? If you can deploy those on a massive basis, you get a massive network. If you have a massive network, you have the ability to get good enough detection, which will allow at a software level to provide um, information to people at the right time in the event of a mass shooting. 
when I think of security, uh, I use airports uh, that you know comes to mind. Uh, you know, a lot of stadiums now have you know the, the long lines to go through the metal right. detector. Um, well, you can be- think of how absurd that is. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Because the first point is, do you think the bad guy's going to take the line? Well, unless he's really stupid. Right. Yeah. Precisely. And so the way that we're envisioning, again, the product stack is that we're doing something called perimeter security. Think about uh, Wi-Fi antennas arrayed, say, for example, on the sidewalk or on the, in the parking lots before you get to the entrance. Of so, the, of so people won't be queued through lines. Correct. Yeah. This will just be random. Obviously, place from perspective that's that's meshed in, in a normal network array. But from the perspective of the mass shooter, it should be ubiquitous and therefore hard to uh, guess yeah. uh, where the location is. And when there's uh, some kind of obfuscation or um, a, a layer that is uh, difficult to, to discover, that's when you've got an opportunity, a leg up on the bad guy. How are you going to determine what are the bad guys and what are the good guys, like the police with the, the guns? So, that is the question for yeah. the company. And that's, it's a really hard technology problem to solve. Yeah. And uh, without giving any way, uh, without giving away any proprietary secrets, I would say that there's a mix of uh, the metal detection layer yeah. and then what we call progressive surveillance. So a layer where the good enough detection says, Hey, somebody over there is a bad guy. Yeah. You need to do something about it. And then progressive surveillance and response. So cameras, and more importantly, information to a security guard, to a police officer, that they can say on their smartphone, oh, go look at that guy. Get them before they get to the entrance is the point. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've been reading a lot about Wi-Fi technology late, lately. Um, I think scientists at MIT have figured out how to use Wi-Fi signals to even uh, see people's uh, heartbeat and detect their emotions and, and things like that. Well, that was actually Rutgers that originally discovered that. So Rutgers University were the uh, inventors of the technology, which we license on an exclusive basis okay. to really kind of develop this company. And that's where this whole journey began. They realized that you could use little bits of information in the Wi-Fi spectrum to, and it was and it was finely detailed enough that you could detect heart rate and respiration. And so, from there we went. So you could detect if someone is feeling agitated. <laughs> Theoretically, yeah. you could feel, you could detect uh, a heartbeat. Now, yeah. Not in the context of the product we're developing right now, but that's that's how detailed the the spectrum can um, provide. The detailed information the spectrum can provide. We're talking with Robert Delmar. He's the CEO of First Responder Technologies. Uh, uh, all about uh, weapons detection. You guys are using Wi-Fi to, uh, uh, I guess, further what you're developing right now. Can we talk about the privacy issues? Because I know people listening right now are thinking, "Oh my God, now Wi-Fi is spying on me." Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's that's a reasonable conclusion. The good news is um, what Wi-Fi is really doing is taking little bits of information about people that are carrying long guns and providing it to police officers in our case. So very different idea. Um, the reality is, is that the, the signal, like I said before, is sensitive enough. It's good enough, but it's not so high resolution that, for example, you have to worry about somebody um, getting personal information about you. Keep thinking about, you know, hanging out in in your living room in your underwear. It's not that. <laughs> it's, it's not reading your bank card information. Correct. That's and, right. Yeah. That's right. It's it's not that sensitive, thankfully. Yeah. But it's sensitive enough. If you were carrying a firearm in your living room, absolutely, it would be able to tell you that that there's a long gun in the in the living room. Boy, you should probably check that out. I imagine with this type of technology, instead of having the long queues, you know, going through metal detectors, this would kind of free things up in larger events and stadiums and, and subways. Yeah, you know, I think that depending on the value of the target, unfortunately, and I hate using language like that, but you have to think the way the bad guys think. Um, the more people that are congregated in one place, the higher the likelihood it is, and especially it's not something we think about necessarily here in Canada, because with the exception of the Parliament Hill lone wolf case, uh, most of the big uh, terrorist attacks were interdicted by our security professionals. Um, but in this particular case, uh, the more valuable the target, the likelihood is that they're going to be progressively um, more invasive layers of security. 
So you absolutely probably do need to have um, a front entrance x-ray machine still. And why wouldn't you? Um, you know, if you think about this in the sense of like a medieval fortress, or if you go to the Citadel in Halifax, for example, right? They've got the high walls. And behind the high walls is a place where guys can shoot at you. And then inside, there's a, a second layer of defense where if, oh, we, we lost the walls, we can go back in further into the fortress. Same idea here. And so, especially at a, at a sports stadium, for example, there's clearly going to be some kind of highly invasive um, radar type technology, whether it's my millimeter wave or some otherwise, that will uh, be deployed. But what about the parking lots? Why wouldn't you want to have more information before they get to the building? And that's where we come in. We call well, that the perimeter security. Well, I look option. at the Manchester uh, Perfect terrorist example. attack there. Yeah. I mean, he didn't make his way into the stadium. Correct. He was on the outside. Correct. Yeah, he did all the damage in the lobby there. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the November 13 attacks in France were similar. The Sade de France attack. The idea there, they think, was that they were going to set off a suicide bomb outside. People would rush out, and then they would set off a second and a third. And what stopped one of the attacks was a smart security guard who said, this guy looks out of place. Yeah. So, again, the interesting thing about the security paradigm is, and New York City probably said that does this best, it says, if you see something, say something a human being is still going to be your best line of defense. So, I mean, this isn't the end-all be-all of security. It's still going to rely not. on a number of other In uh, fact, we, we are a human-centric company. The idea is, again, from the founder of our company who, who lived as an RCMP officer, these kind of threats, um, the idea is that if you get better information to security professionals, that's just one step further toward being able to thwart a, a, a terrorist attack or mass shooting some some bad guy who's intent on doing harm robert where can people find out more information about first responders uh they can check out our website of course it's www.firstrespondertech.com thanks for joining us today yeah thank you very much when we come back from the break more tech to talk here on get connected back after this you are back with get connected mike agarbo here i've got john bueller in studio with me let's talk about the exciting world of insurance <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't sound exciting, but there are some innovative things happening uh, with regards to uh, insurance and technology. To help us uh, understand some of that, we've uh, got our guest. His name is Karim Hirji. He's uh, on the line. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, we're going to be talking about something called uh, Intact Ventures, which uh, I believe you are a part of. And, and tell us what that's all about. I'd be happy to, Mike. Uh, Intact Ventures is a $250 million corporate venture arm of Intact Financial. Uh, Intact Financial is uh, Canada's largest home auto and business insurer. We insure uh, over 5 million Canadians from coast to coast. Uh, and your listeners in BC uh, would probably know us a little bit uh, better by our two main brands, Intact Insurance and Bellar Direct. And in, in BC, for example, uh, what types of insurance would you do here? Yeah, so in BC, uh, we would be writing, you know, your homeowner's insurance. We would also be insuring uh, small to large uh, businesses. Uh, and we also provide uh, some auto insurance uh, in excess of what ICBC would be offering. I believe I have that. Full disclosure. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. Um, so tell us about Intact Ventures. Uh, what, what type of things are you investing in as far as insurance and technology? Yeah, Mike, so I think... You know, we're doing a lot of great things here at Intact Financial within our walls. But, you know, back in 2015, we realized that the world is moving quite quickly, especially from a technology perspective. And, you know, you and your listeners have seen the explosion of data out there in terms of how customers are using mobile devices uh, and how that has changed what they're demanding in the world. Uh, and I think you're seeing that in all aspects of what they're interacting with, insurance just being one. So really, my focus uh, from an intact ventures perspective is to make sure that uh, we're staying close to the cutting edge of what customers are demanding, uh, because really, at the end of the day, we're here to create products uh, to meet the needs of customers both today and tomorrow. And for me, the four main areas that we're focused on uh, in terms of investments would be mobility, which would be defined as how customers get from point A to point B. Uh, the second would be the sharing economy. Uh, the third would be distribution. So how will customers actually purchase insurance in the future? 
Uh, and then the fourth would be data and AI. Let's, uh, do you have some examples from the different categories there, for example, in mobility? Yeah. Uh, so for mobility, you can think about mobility today in terms of how uh, customers are actually utilizing, for example, telematics devices in their vehicle, uh, all the way to perhaps having fully autonomous vehicles. Uh, you know, and we can debate whether that's 10, 15, 20 years from now. But I think that's going to have a profound impact, uh, both in terms of what happens in cities, but also on the insurance industry. Um, in that example, we've invested in a company called Voyage, uh, which is based in Silicon Valley. They're uh, developing autonomous vehicles today. But the interesting part about Voyage, uh, in comparison to uh, some of their competitors, is they actually have their autonomous vehicles on the road today uh, in some of the gated communities in the U.S. So they're able to test the impact today. Uh, we're able to partner with them and understand the data that's coming from some of these autonomous vehicles and potentially how that will impact pricing and product uh, for customers in the future. Well, it's interesting. Uh, we know autonomous vehicles are, are coming. Uh, some, <clears throat> some of them already have some basic features of that. Uh, I have a Tesla. I've got the auto steer. Uh, you know, we even heard, you know, rumors that Tesla might even get into the insurance game. Uh, and, you know, they're pushing insurance companies to give lower rates uh, to people that have autonomous, autonomous vehicles. Do you see that happening in the future? Lower rates? Can you, can you give me a deal on my Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'd have to talk to ICBC about that as well. Yeah, but I think, you know, yeah. you make a good point. When you talk about uh, cars becoming more sophisticated, I, I can foresee, Mike, uh, when we have, you know, full level five fully autonomous vehicles on the road, that the frequency or the incidence of accidents will go down. I have no doubt about that. And that's going to happen, you know, in 20, 25 years from now. The problem is between now and then, you're going to have an influx of these more sophisticated vehicles on the road, like your Tesla, uh, with human drivers. And what we're seeing in that phenomenon is two things. Number one, the frequency of accidents or the number of accidents really haven't gone down. But even more surprisingly is, the cost to actually repair these vehicles is going up because your Tesla has a lot of very sophisticated parts in there that are more expensive to uh, replace than my old 1995 Honda Civic when I grew up in Burnaby, BC. I'm going to need a lot of insurance for my Tesla going for, forward because I just downloaded the latest update and I have car karaoke now. So <laughs> <laughs> things, things are not going to end well for me. So uh, this is good to know. Uh, let's talk about some of the other pillars you mentioned uh, as, as well. Uh, you talked about uh, pillar number two again, which was? The sharing economy. And I think that like would things be actually... Like, like Uber and things like that? Yeah, that's a perfect example. And I think when we're thinking about it from a ventures lens, you know, investments are one way that we could uh, help the company uh, think about what's happening in the future. But there's also partnerships that we... Uh, undertake to actually create products and services. And, you know, there's probably two pertinent, ex pertinent examples uh, that I can mention. The first would be, uh, you know, Uber. We saw the uh, explosion and the relevance of ride sharing um, in Toronto, but also what was happening in the U.S. back in 2015. Uh, and we know that cars are the most underutilized asset that a person owns. Um, you know, studies have shown that a person drives a car about 4% of the time. Uh, so based upon that, you know, we thought that trying to form a partnership or develop solutions for customers that are participating in ride sharing would be important, as well as developing solutions for customers that wanted to rent their cars the 96% of the time they weren't being used, uh, and developing solutions for car sharing would be critical as well. So in 2015, we announced our partnership with Uber. Uh, we worked with government bodies, with uh, municipal bodies, with insurance bodies in Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta. Uh, and we developed insurance solutions so that every single Uber ride uh, in those three provinces starting in 2016 have been fully protected by intact insurance. Uh, at the same time, we made a financial investment through our ventures arm in a car sharing company called Turo, which is the leading car sharing company in North America. Uh, we created insurance products uh, for them as well. And we now have, uh, again, in uh, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia, uh, shortly in Nova Scotia, the ability for customers to rent out their cars uh, to other individuals when they're not being used. Interesting. So I could 
pay off my Tesla by renting it to other people. And, and I you, will have insurance for it. <laughs> absolutely. And actually that's, you know, if you look up on the Turo website, one of the, you know, this isn't a Turo advertisement by any means, but one of the unique things about Turo is you could rent, you know, a regular car, but a lot of people are renting their high end vehicles uh, and using that to supplement the cost of a lease, et cetera, uh, as they buy these cars. Let's talk about some of the other technologies that I need to see. Like, for the love of God, can I buy my insurance online? It's 2019. <laughs> I know ICBC. I don't know where they're at with that, but... I think it's ICBC. Is it? Oh, is it just ICBC? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think most other companies... Have it Karim online. can fix that. Yeah. He's got $250 million. <laughs> <laughs> it may take more than $250 million to fix ICBC, <laughs> but I'll leave that one aside. Uh, so the third pillar, what have you got going there? Yeah, so I think when we talk about distribution, um, it's all about how customers want to purchase insurance in the future. And, you know, you raise a good point around the digital online experience. And, you know, we recognized that trend uh, many years ago. And Bellar Direct, uh, which operates in, in BC, was the first insurer in Canada to offer uh, a full online insurance purchasing decision that consumers could have in Canada. Uh, you know, but that was a couple of decades ago. What's going to happen two or three decades from now? Uh, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing and the investments that we've made um, are prominent in the United States. We've invested in a company called Metro Mile, which charges insurance by the mile. And, you know, if you drive less than 10,000 miles uh, in the U.S. and you insure with Metro Mile, you know, you save on average about four to five hundred dollars compared to uh, the next most popular insurer. And with rapid urbanization happening, uh, you know, I've seen projections where 90% of the world's population or Canadian population is going to be in urban cities in the next 20 years. Uh, you're going to see less kilometers being driven. And as a result, uh, solutions like Metro Mile uh, may make a lot more sense. Um, we've also just, our most recent investment actually, was in a company called Akko uh, in India. And Akko is doing something very interesting where they're providing, you know, micro insurance uh, to Indians for, you know, cents on the dollar. An example would be uh, if you're in a ride-sharing vehicle in India and you want to buy insurance um, based upon the fact that your flight, you may not make your flight if the car is delayed, you can buy that on the spot within your ride-sharing vehicle in India. So we're paying attention to what's happening in North America, but also in other emerging markets. And can some of these distribution trends uh, come back and play a role in what Intact is trying to build in the future? That is cool. Buying insurance in case you miss your plane because you can't get there because of traffic. That's that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, the fourth pillar again. The fourth pillar is data and AI. And Mike, I have to admit, data and AI, even though it's a separate bucket, it really underpins everything that I've been talking about. Because without data, um, you know, ride sharing wouldn't happen. Uh, the insurance that ACO is producing wouldn't happen. But we do consider, you know, data to be a fourth pillar. And an example I'll give you there is an, is an investment that we made in a company called Climacell last year, uh, which is based in the United States. But, you know, I'm, I'm a runner. And one of the things that frustrates me a lot is when I get up in the morning, I take a look at my uh, weather app and it tells me that it's sunny outside, but I go outside and it's raining. And, you know, it's raining where I am, but it's probably sunny a kilometer away. So Climate Cell is trying to change that by using the data emitted from cell phones and between cell phone towers to actually give precise weather prediction uh, on a smaller scale. And, you know, we could think about utilizing that in insurance in a couple of ways. We could provide that data to customers when they access our app, which I think is a good convenience. But secondly, you know, in Alberta, for example, uh, us and Albertans every year deal with a lot of issue with hail damage. And if we could provide more precise information to Albertans when the next hail storm may come, you know, this totally aligns with our philosophy of protecting Canadians uh, and making sure that we prevent damage wherever we can. We're talking uh, with Karim Hirji. He is with Intact Insurance talking about uh, the giant uh, venture fund. How much is it? $250 million, correct? That's correct. I just need about ten million. <laughs> if if you what's can... your idea? I might I might be interested in investing. I I just need ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Carpool karaoke. Carpool karaoke. 
<laughs> to ensure Tesla owners. Uh, Karim, I want to thank you for joining us. Where can people find out more information? Uh, they can visit us uh, on our website, uh, and there's a, a page on there about Intact Ventures, so uh, feel free to look us up. When we come back from the break, more tech to talk here on Get Connected. Stay tuned. You are back with Get Connected. It's Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We've got uh, one of our favorite Alberta tech guests on the line right now. Uh, her name is Erin Lawrence from, I forget, Canada Technology? <laughs> TechGadgetsCanada.com. TechGadgetsCanada.com. One day I will get that right. That's okay. It just gives me another chance to say it. TechGadgetsCanada.com. TechGadgetsCanada.com. We're going to talk about home security now. There's uh, some really exciting things happening in that realm. Uh, you know, back in the day, I remember when I first got my house 20 years ago, you basically get the alarm company to come in. They install the alarm system. Usually it was free because then they charge you like an exorbitant amount. Open your wallet. Open your wallet. 30 bucks a month and we'll look after you. Uh, well, technology has really done a number over the past few years. There's all sorts of different types of cameras and lighting and alarm systems that are available that kind of let you do it yourself. So I want to talk about some of the cool gear out there and is it uh, safe and wise to do it yourself <laughs> or should you have a professional company come in and do it? Erin, your thoughts. I think in this day and age, it's great to do it yourself. I think it's easy to install a lot of these gadgets. They're easy to operate. They're is easy to physically install. Um, I'm thinking about smart door locks as one example. I've I think I have a different smart door lock on each door in my house. <laughs> so I've installed several of them. And some of them are definitely easier than others. Some of them are more universal than others. But with a little bit of know-how and just following the instructions that a lot of these companies will give you, it can be very easy for you to do it yourself. With that said, if you're not handy, a locksmith is a good friend to have. Okay, Erin, pick your favorite smart lock. If I had to pick one, I'm going to go with the lock that is on my front door right now, and that's the Wiser Premise. It's got a bunch of different ways that you can access it. You can use a physical key if that's still what you want to do. It's got a digital keypad that you can use. You can also use your smartphone to unlock it from wherever you are. And whether you need to let someone in like a neighbor and you're out of town or out of the country, you can still use your smartphone to give whoever needs to get into your home access. And it's pretty easy. I have an August lock. Uh, this is kind of one of the first smart locks that were out there. Um, and basically you change the hardware on the inside of the door. You could still use your key on the outside, uh, but they had this giant round thing that you can turn physically, manually to lock or unlock the door. And of course, it's smart as well. So works with your smartphone. The problem I found, though, is the rest of my family hated it <laughs> because <laughs> it would never work with their smartphones. And I think it's because they didn't try. You know what I mean? Because you got to set up the app and got to have all the Bluetooth things working. I thought it was amazing. And it's still amazing to this day for me because as I'm walking up to my front door, the door just automatically unlocks. It is just brilliant. Uh, so you know what I had to end up doing? Uh, August has a separate keypad. You can actually buy a little wireless one. So I have that kind of off to the side. And now they like it. But, you know, I, I would recommend if you're getting into a smart lock, I would get one with a keypad. So I know the wiser one has that. Yeah, and there's another one called the Schlage. Oh, my gosh. Now the name of it has escaped me. The but encode? Similar. Thank you. Thank you yes. very much. Yes, the encode. And it does have a keypad on the front. And a lot of the same features, right? Like a lot of these locks are very similar. Mike, I do like the August lock though, actually for exactly the reason that you mentioned. And that's that you don't need to change the outside of the lock. You don't need to rekey the lock. You don't need to worry about getting another key because you're just swapping out the hardware on the back. Though I will say the first time uh, my housekeeper came over and was trying to let herself out of the door, she couldn't figure out how to operate that's, the lock. That's a YouTube video. Just a giant cylinder. <laughs> yeah, that's a YouTube video right there. She's locked in forever. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the uh, the cameras uh, and the ecosystems now. Uh, I've uh, I've tried a number of ones. I tried the Arlo uh, security cams. Those were awesome because they're wireless. Uh, they have the rechargeable batteries now, so it's really easy to place them. Uh, I've kind of gone over to the Ring system, to be honest. Uh, I'm finding that their ecosystem is really diverse. They've got all sorts of different types of 
security cams and, and lights and even an alarm system now. Uh, and it's Amazon, so you know they're going to be around for a few years. That's important when you're buying this stuff, uh, especially when there's like cloud-based uh, things. But your thoughts on that, uh, Aaron? Yeah, I, I love Ring as well. I started out with one of their cameras, just a wireless security camera with the optional um, solar panel a couple of years ago. And just found that the quality of the video was really good. It's got night vision, so you can see what's going on in your yard even at night. And just the connectivity and the setup, everything was so easy. So I expanded with a second camera for the front of my house. And then I added the Ring Video doorbell, which I just love because, again, if I need to let somebody in, I can actually use the Ring Video doorbell and the camera on it to confirm who's at the door and then unlock it if I need to. I have an Amazon Echo Show 5. It's like the little mini Amazon Alexa. It's like my nightstand clock now, but it's cool because I have the Ring camera. When I get in a notification, it just pops up the video right there. Same with the doorbell. If someone presses my doorbell, I can yeah. be laying in bed and I can talk to the FedEx guy deliver delivering a package saying, just put it down. It's delivering that late? What kind of FedEx driver? Uh, in the morning. <laughs> Do you know? I sleep in long. <laughs> uh, and Ring has a whole new outdoor light system as well, uh, like pathway lights and motion sensors and floodlights. Uh, it's pretty cool because... Uh, the motion sensors all tie back in. You got to get what's called a ring bridge, so it ties in with your Wi-Fi. Uh, but you'll actually get notifications if someone trips the the path lights, for example, which I thought was cool. Yeah, and that whole system is integrated, which I love. So the cameras, or sorry, the lights all have motion sensors on them, and you can add other motion sensors in other areas. But if somebody does trip the motion sensor, you can have it set up so that the cameras around your property will automatically start recording. And of course, the lights have automatically come on so that you've got an even better nighttime picture, for example. And just to your point, Mike, it's it's really great how everything does work together in that ecosystem. It works really well. We're talking with Erin Lawrence. She's from TechGadgetsCanada.com. Tech I got it. I got it right. TechGadgetsCanada.com. Uh, thanks for joining us, Erin. Thanks, you guys. When we come back from the break, it's the Amazon Skill of the Week. Stay tuned. It's that time of the program where we give you our Amazon Skill of the Week. If you have an Amazon Echo device, uh, or any device that uses the Alexa voice assistant, this is for you. What do we got? We've got baby stats. This is for new parents. Okay. So if uh, it's a perfect thing where your hands are full to talk to your smart device. Yeah. And so now you can actually track all of your baby's business, feedings, weight, sleep, and so much more. Uh, basically, you connect the Alexa app to the baby stats iOS or Android app. And you basically are then able to say to Alexa, ask baby stats to add poop and pee. <laughs> and you can track all this stuff. I'm not a parent, so I don't know if this is important. <laughs> Maybe Mike can tell us if this is Okay, I've you... had three babies. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know if I was keeping track of the poop and pee so much, but obviously there's more than just, yeah, yes. Than the poop and this is like an auditory baby dashboard, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can just log anything that you need to log. Realistically speaking, though, you couldn't. You don't just have to limit this to babies. You could actually use this for your own stats, should you want to have your own dashboard. Correct. Weird. Yes. Sorry, what's it called again? Baby stats. Baby stats. Yeah. Okay, it's fascinating. You know, here's, the, here's the thing. I'm actually gonna. I'm gonna set this up for my dog. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not called dog stats. It's I know. Called, he's, or puppy stats. He's my little baby, though. So He does peep and poo a lot, though. Right? Yeah. Who wants to keep track of that? <laughs> that's what I was trying to figure out. Why, why? I mean, that's just one of many stats you can record. Yeah. But it's the funnest one to say on the radio. Well, this, so. this is kind of the thing is like the question is, did the dog, you know, do number one and number two this morning? No, just number one. So you need to take him out a little bit earlier. So this is actually not a bad thing. I would say, uh, why don't we, I'm going to give this a, a, a shot. Baby stats, a skill for your Amazon Alexa device. That's all the time we have left. Hit our website, getconnectedmedia.com, where we have all our podcasts and the video podcasts of the program as well, including our app show, sister show, every Sunday here on Global News Radio, CKNW 980. This is Mike, John, and Graham logging off for Get Connected. We'll see you again next time.